Oh, there we go. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to welcome to Tuesday. Um, as we were sort of not talking about, of course, Canada had an election yesterday, and nothing really changed. We have the same government that we had before the election, but the important thing is we spent six hundred million dollars to do that. So, score. Yeah. It's okay. I'm sure we didn't have anything better to spend that 600 million on, I'm sure. So, that's okay. Um so, as you heard on Zerlinda's announcement, so tomorrow we're going to have a lockdown drill. Does anyone know what that is? What is it? <laughs> it's a it's a drill where we practice locking down. Yeah. So if you've never been through one of these before, the whole point is, is that if somebody should enter the building who is unsafe or intent on hurting people, we need to protect ourselves. And so what happens is, is that we will get a little um, announcement here saying lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. And what I'll do is I'll go and close the door over there and pull the shade down and you all will sort of go into that corner of the room, okay? Because you can't really see. That way, if anyone looks in the window, they can't see anyone. Uh, and basically, we sit there. We don't use our phones, which I know was going to be probably the hardest part of this whole thing. Keep nice and quiet, and we just kind of wait it out, right? And so the idea is, is if somebody finds their way into the school who is dangerous, basically, we're not showing them any people. Right? There's nobody out in the hall. If there is, I'll grab them and pull them in. There's nobody in the hall. There's no rooms they can get into. There's no one they can see. There's no one they can hear. And we basically just wait for the police to show up and deal with them. Right? So again, the odds of something like this happening are tiny. Right? Not impossible, but tiny. But anyway, we just want to be, we want to be ready just in case because you know, you never know, and our, you know, the number one priority here is that we keep everyone safe, right? So we'll practice that tomorrow. Again, it's not really a big deal, but we'll do it anyway, just in case, okay? Any questions on that before we continue on? No, no, no. Yes, no, okay. Um, right, so yesterday we were uh, we started talking, well, actually, here's what we're going to do. Nope, that's not right. We're not going to talk about Mean Girls. Because that's n not the right one. Yeah, give me one second here. Uh, I've got to... Did I, grab the, did I export the wrong PDF? Or did I just put the wrong PDF into my streaming software? What did I do? Yo-Ya, yeah, what, what did I do here? How did I screw this up? I need answers. <laughs> I'm just I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm just going to, there we go, export that. Oh, you can see that. Interesting. Uh, and then I'm going to go into here and into here and into here. Oh, that's what I did. I did do the wrong thing. Okay. There we go. That's what I meant to do. Okay. So, yesterday, so the, the assignment about the, um, where I asked you to read that article by Jared Diamond and figure out the arguments. That's, that's, that was due last night, it's all done. So I'm gonna mark it this afternoon, but I just want to kind of go over the, the you know, what that article contained, just so we know, okay? So don't panic about that. This was our first kind of kick at the can, if you will, in terms of pulling arguments out of things and, I will try to um, I will try to have um, you know we'll we'll try to keep doing that right because I think that's an important skill for us to learn. But again, this is our first try. I will remember that when I mark right. I, I know this is our first first try. So yeah, but I I am curious to see kind of how we did and if we were able to find what we needed to find. Okay, but I do want to go over this just so we know we've covered it. So. Yesterday, before we kind of talked about civilizations and before we started talking about Mesopotamia, we said this, right? We said that foragers had kind of disappeared. Um, people had started um, farming around 12,000 years ago, 
and then other people followed suit later on. And why was that, right? Why did people make this massive change to their subsistence strategy when they had been successful with hunting and gathering for hundreds of thousands of years, right? And of course, Jared Diamond had something to say about that. I said there was two arguments in that paper, uh, and then I asked you some questions. So um, can anyone, so just from memory, tell me what the premises were for the first argument? So the, the progressivist argument was that switching to agriculture was good move. Of course humans did it, duh, right? Why, why was it a good move? Right, so the progressivist said that farming is easier. Right? It's, it's much less work than wandering around everywhere, you know, looking for your food every day. Right? What else did the progressivists say? Okay. So it's less time consuming, right? So not only is it less work, it's you can get your food in shorter time. And what else? And gain more food and... Okay, a better... So the quality of life is better and we can get more food or better food? More, more, more better food? Yeah. More and better food, okay. Yeah, things cannot be more better. That's not grammatically correct. Although sometimes it's fun to say things that are not grammatically correct. Um, okay, so we've got, so, the, so we switching to farming was a good move, less work, less time consuming, more food, better quality food. Uh, why else? Why else was this a good move? Is there anything else in there? Okay, farming can support more people, right? Bigger communities, very true. What else? Yeah, right, the progressivist argument is that, you know, we, we had people making art and building the Parthenon and writing symphonies and all of that is because they have so much free time because they're not wandering the landscape looking for their food, right? Um, anything else? Oh yeah, right, you don't have to continually wander around looking for your food, you can you can actually have a, a home, right? You can stay in one, one place. What else? Anything else? I'm not saying there is, I'm just, sometimes you guys come up with stuff that I had missed or that I've forgotten about, so. Maybe there is more, maybe there isn't. Say again? Um, Sorry, they got more what than hunting? Like, when, when you like look at the, the land, uh -huh. the, it's not dangerous more than hunting. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's, not, it's not dangerous. Farming is not dangerous, right? Yeah, there's something to be said for that too, right? If you're going to go and stick a pointy stick in a large animal, that's dangerous, right? You, you know, the, the animal is not going to take that lightly. And so, yeah, hunting can be dangerous depending on what you're hunting for. And yeah, farming is much safer, a much safer thing to do, definitely. Anything else? Okay, um, that's pretty good, and, and that's that's good. That's what the that's what the progressivist claimed, right? Of course, people would switch to farming. It's great, right? You can do all the. Oh, the other thing uh, is that you can store your food. Right? They said that you know storing your food away is nice because you've always got you know you've always got a backup right you've always got a, a full fridge which is full fridges are nice right yeah okay so but Diamond Jared Diamond of course says no I don't buy that I think it's different right I think that the switch to agriculture was actually a big mistake and why does he why does he say that.
Um, I need to say that once more. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't think my hearing is going, but it, it is tough with the mask, so you've really got to like yell at me. What's that? Oh, okay. So, so Jared Diamond says that the, the, the diets of farmers have less, pro, less protein, okay. And nutrients, okay. Good, what else does he say? Or what, what's, what are his other reasons for saying that the switch to farming was a... Okay, so he, he kind of lays the... Um, he kind of makes agriculture responsible for sexual inequality that we have in society and also for class inequality as well, right? So he says agriculture or farming is, is the result of, or is to blame for having, some people having more money and power and status than, than others, right? Okay, uh, what else does Jared say? Jared Diamond. Oh yeah, so they chose they chose kind of quantity over quality when they switched to farming, right? And and I think that's connected to the first premise, the idea that um, you know you can you could um, yeah that the 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 diet f of farmers was not as nutritious as um, a, as hunter gatherers, but they got more, right? They got more calories out of it. Okay, that's true. What else does he what, what else is, is happening here? What else is he saying? Um, oh yeah, so Kayla, he did say that. I'm gonna get to that in one second. Um, okay, let me, let me see what I have here in terms of slides, okay? So the progressivist theory was that the idea is that agriculture was a good idea and you know that this was progress, right? Of course people switched to agriculture for, for progress. Um, Jared Diamond, on the other hand, thinks otherwise, right? And he, I think, as, as near as I can tell, he had three premises, but I'm open to, I'm open to seeing it different, a different way. Um, this is one of the things that I think that he was saying, right? Is that early farmers saw a decline in their overall health, right? And so we saw that in a number of ways and Kayla mentions that and I guess this is actually the um, the answer to number two but yeah he said that there was evidence of disease do you remember what kind of diseases he mentioned tuberculosis and what yeah mentioned a few I remember tuberculosis most strongly well, you know what, let's, yeah, let's stay with this. So he mentioned tuberculosis, right, as one of these diseases. Um, he mentioned shorter height, right, and that's what Kayla mentioned. And so, again, your, the height you grow to is somewhat genetic, right? You have, you get genes from your parents that determine how tall you're going to grow, but it's also based on nutrition, right? And if you don't get the right amount of nutrition or appropriate nutrition, especially when you're young, you may not actually grow to your full height, right? Of course, you would never know because you didn't grow that tall, but there's nutrition is part of it, right? It's not just genes. Um, they said shorter life expectancy. Do you remember the numbers that they were talking about? Yeah, so he said that, er so these early foragers had a, a life expectancy of about 26 years, and then for early farmers, it went down to 19. Right now, does that mean like everyone died after, bef like when they got to 20 years old, they just no. The 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 life expectancies. I'll tell you, the life expectancies of these early kind of societies are deceiving a little bit, because contrary to most modern societies, a lot of children die before the age of two. 
Okay, so a lot of kids die in childbirth or they die shortly after or they die when they're quite young. And so what that does to the average is it pulls it, it pulls the average way down, right? So, you know, if the hunter-gatherers are living to an average age of 26, it doesn't mean that everyone is, you know, it doesn't mean there's no 30-year-olds. It just means that a lot of young kids don't survive, unfortunately. But, you know, were there 40 or 50-year-old hunter-gatherers? Yeah, there probably were, right? But again, the average gets pulled down. In a modern society where fewer children die and we live longer, it pulls the average up, right? And so it's a little deceiving here. It, like, you know, people didn't die as soon as they hit 20 years old, but certainly life expectancy was not, not then, it, it wasn't what it is now, right? But it's, it's skewed by the fact that people don't live as long and by the fact that so many young children die before the age of two, it just pulls, pulls the average way down. And so it makes it seem like a bigger difference than it is. But it's still a, it's worth pointing out, right? But anyway, Jared Diamond says, yeah, the height, the height of these early farmers actually on average decreases quite a bit, right? They, they're talking about from like, uh, what are the average, like five, six down to like five feet, I think, for women and five, nine to five, two or something for men? Five, four? Yeah, so big reductions in, in height, right, between these two groups. And he talks about enamel hypoplasia, okay? So let me show you some of these things just so they, they make sense, okay? Oh good, okay, right slide. So here, is any idea what, do you have any idea what you're looking at here? Yeah, so we've got part of a human skull here. Um, what you're looking at, I believe, is the, the right upper, the upper right side of somebody's mouth. Good morning. So you can see the, the first tooth that is on the right is their front tooth, and then it kind of goes around the side to their molars in the back, okay? So we have a little fragment of a human skull here, but what I want you to pay attention to is those little ridges. Do you see the little ridges? The little lines that go across. So this is this is what they call enamel hypoplasia. Okay, and so how these little lines develop is your teeth grow inside your gums, right? So children have no teeth, and then they have baby teeth, right? And then their adult teeth are forming in their gums, and then they kind of push out the baby teeth. It's really gross when you think about it. Push out the baby teeth, and then you get your adult teeth. Right? So while those teeth are kind of growing in your gums or in children's gums, um, your, bo your body's basically making a mineral, right? So your, the enamel on your teeth is actually, a, it's a rock, if you will. Um, and so your body is kind of synthesizing this mineral or this rock. But what can happen is that if you, as a child, undergo a period of malnutrition where there's just not a lot of food available, like severe starvation level. What happens is in order for your body to conserve resources, it stops making enamel. So it kind of hits pause on the enamel formation. And then, you know, when the food comes back, your body kind of starts it up again. And so, but what happens is because your enamel only forms at that time, like you don't get any more tooth enamel, it actually leaves a little ridge, there's a little line where you didn't get enough food and your body didn't make any enamel. And depending on how many sort of periods of sh food shortage or starvation you can have, sometimes you can have multiple lines on the teeth. And as you can see, they're, they're quite visible, right? This one's, there's kind of some dirt in there so it makes it show up a little more. But they're quite visible. And depending on how, you know, depending on how low the or how bad the food shortage is, those grooves can actually be really deep, right? And so when you see this, you don't really see it on modern people very much, but when you see this on early farmers, you know, that tells you that these people were experiencing pretty significant food shortages when they were young, and it's left a pretty clear mark on their teeth. You don't often see this on hunter-gatherer teeth, um, but you do see it 
you do see it on farmers. Okay. Um, does that make sense? See that? Uh, what else do I have? Oh, yes. This, what you are looking at here is again a piece of a human skull. And I think it's the, the right side. So you're kind of looking at the top, kind of the top area up here is what you're looking at. So you can see on the right side there's a, there's a joint in your skull that goes here. And then there's a joint or a suture if you want to use fancy terms. A suture that goes right down the middle and then it kind of sp splits in a V down the back. Right? So we're looking at the right side of the skull on the top, but that is not normal. Okay? So the bone on your skull should be nice and smooth. Right? It should not look like a latte, which I think is kind of what that looks like. Um, and so what this is called, you don't need to remember these terms, by the way, what this is called is parotic hyperostosis. Okay? And what's happening here is that this person is ill, okay? They have a disease. And not just a simple, you know, a cold or the flu or something like this. This person had a disease that they dealt with for months and months and months and maybe years, okay? And so when you are, when you have a serious disease for that long, the body, again, is trying to fight the disease. And so your body will start to pull the things that it needs from the body itself, right? And so what happens here is that the, the body is kind of pulling minerals and um, things it needs from your actual bone tissue to try to fight this disease. And it's leaving all these little, all these little bubbly holes in the bone, right? And so, again, this, when an archaeologist finds this, this tells us that this person was ill. Right, for with a serious disease like tuberculosis, and they were ill for quite a long time. Right? And so again, if you get <laughs> if you get a cold, don't worry, your bones will not be remodeling. But yeah, if you have tuberculosis for a year or so, yeah, you're gonna see some stuff happening, right? Um, here's another example of something similar. So you're looking here into uh, a human skull into the left eye socket. So you're looking kind of up into it. And again, that should be nice and smooth back there. Right? It should be nice, smooth bone. But as you can see, it's all kind of holy, right? And so again, the body's doing the same thing. It's pulling resources from the body to fight you know, a serious infection or a serious disease. And it's remodeling the person's bones. And again, this is pretty clear evidence of long-term illness. Um, I'll show you this too. This is, um, this is evidence of tuberculosis. And so this, these two people here had a pretty serious case. What you're looking at is the, the backbone, right? The vertebrae. And so I think the one on the right, you're probably looking at a person's lower back. So kind of You've got your sacrum kind of right on your, your butt, which is kind of a V-shaped thing. And then the, the vertebrae sit on top of it. So this is the, the lowest vertebrae in your back. That's L5, they call it. And then L4, L3, and L2. And so you can, what these are supposed to look like is if you look at the one on the top right, that's kind of what that bone is supposed to look like. It's not perfectly smooth. so. The, the faces that are like this, those are a little more smooth because that's where your, the discs go, the vertebral discs fit. So those are a little smoother and, and nicer looking. On the outside, they're a little rougher looking, but they're not supposed to look like that, right? On the left, you can see there's all kinds of weird holes in the vertebrae themselves, and that's not, that's not good, right? You have a serious disease or a serious infection, and the bone is kind of remodeling around it. You can also see um, bones that look like that when, uh, when someone has a severe infection. So, you know, when you have an infection, you're getting lots of like pus and liquid formed. And if it's serious enough, sometimes the bone will actually remodel to try and get all of that stuff out. And often you'll see that when people have tooth or dental infections. Um, 
you'll see that they're like holes will actually develop in the bone because the body is trying to like push all of this stuff out and it can't it can't get it out any other way and so again when you see that sort of stuff these are people with you know serious diseases or serious infections and ones that don't kill them right away but ones that they live with for quite some period and again things like tuberculosis um, those are those are diseases of civilization right those are diseases that you get by living in big groups of people and living with people living in groups where there's no sanitation right so I think if you're like me you guys you kind of take for granted the fact that we have running water and flushing toilets right but you know you go into the bathroom you do a bunch of nasty stuff you flush it and it's gone right you'll never see it again it will never trouble anyone again but thousands of years ago there's none of that right and this stuff can get into the groundwater people don't know anything about disease they don't know how it works and so it's very easy for them to get infected with you know pretty serious stuff and then it's very easy for them to pass it on because they're living in close quarters and they don't really know you know they don't know what viruses are right they don't know what bacteria are and so things get passed around quite easily with hunter-gatherers you don't see this though because hunter-gatherers are living in small groups right and they're always on the move right and so if you live in a small group of people that never or rarely bumps into anyone else how are you going to get a disease like who's where's it going to come from right everyone is in their own little bubble if you will and the same thing with sanitation hunter gatherers you know they poop in the woods and then they're gone right and they're 10 kilometers away tomorrow and so they don't really have to worry about sanitation very much either because they're always moving around right and so they tend to be much less susceptible to disease so you'll see stuff like this in farming populations but you don't often see it in um, in hunter-gatherer populations they tend to be healthier because they just they live in smaller groups and sanitation is not an issue for them right whereas when you're living in a, a village or a small town with a few thousand people sanitation is a is a thing right and again they don't know what viruses are or bacteria or any of that stuff gross right One more? One more? Yes. Oh, okay. Excellent question, but I'm going to press pause on it because I, I do want to answer it, but not quite yet. But it's, yeah, exactly. Um, one more thing, sorry, I, as a little bit of a, um, when I was a grad student, this is the kind of thing that I used to do. Um, we were, we were, I was part of an archaeological project that looked at hunter-gatherers in Siberia, and so I excavated a lot of human graves, and so I saw lots of this stuff, so I kind of, I nerd out on it just a little bit, because it's, because it's cool. Uh, I'm sorry if it's boring you, but um, I'll try to, <coughs> I'll try to keep it in check here. Um, one last thing that you'll often see with farmers is that farmers don't have very good teeth, early farmers. And they don't for two reasons. One of which, they eat a lot of starchy stuff, right? They eat lots of wheat and things like that. Sticks to the teeth, and then bacteria that like to eat that stuff is what causes cavities, right? So farmers tend to have a lot of cavities and their teeth tend to get worn down because they harvest their grain, right, their wheat, and then they have to grind it into flour, right? So you take a big stone and you put it, you know, you get a flat stone and you put your wheat on there and you grind it into flour so that you can make bread. But while you're doing that, you're also grinding the rock together and you're getting little bits of very fine sand in your flour and in your bread. So while they're eating their bread for an entire lifetime, their bread has an abrasive in it and it's wearing their teeth. And so 
you often see with farmers this, mammal hypoplasia, but you often see a lot more cavities, you see a lot more tooth wear and abrasion. Um, with hunter-gatherers, you rarely see that. Hunter-gatherers have great teeth. Even though they don't brush them, they don't eat a lot of starch. I'm sure their breath was really bad, but they don't eat a lot of starch, and you know they, they don't eat food that is filled with sand, right? So that's the other kind of thing that you see too, is early farmers will have teeth that are just in really bad shape, right? Hunter-gatherers tend to have great teeth. Really good teeth, in fact. Um, okay. Oh, good. The other premise, I think uh, Vittoria mentioned this, was that um, he thought that there were the creation of class divisions in uh, as a result of agriculture as well. Right? And so we kind of saw that happening, right? When I was going through, when I was going through that little graphic with the 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 how you get civilization, people are able to put themselves above others, right? They're able to you know, create an administration and then suddenly they have power over others, right? Because now in the administration I get to say whose farmland is where and who owes me taxes, right? And so we kind of create this social structure that comes from, and I'll quickly review it a little bit later, that comes from agriculture. In foragers, you don't have that, right? Because nobody controls your food source. You want food, just go off and get it, right? If you're part of a hunter-gatherer group and they're treating you crappy, you can go and join another one, right? You don't have to, nobody kind of controls your access to resources, really, right? But in agricultural communities, they do. And as we see through time, as cultures and, and civilizations become more complex, so too do the levels of society, right? And some people will wind up having vast amounts of riches and power to the point where some people at the top are viewed as gods. And then you've got people at the bottom with nothing, right? They may even be slaves. They may not even own their own life, if you will. Somebody else owns it, right? And again, you, don't, you usually don't have that in hunter-gatherer situations. Um, and then finally, we mentioned that um, Jared Diamond suggests that sexual inequality comes from this as well. Okay? And this is kind of interesting because farming, farming families tend to be big, right? Because farming actually, contrary to the progressivist approach, farming is a lot of work, right? You have to be out there in the fields, and you're weeding and watering and you know fixing fences, it's a lot of work, right? And so why not why not create your own little workforce, right? Why not have nine kids and then you can send them out into the fields and they can help you with all the farming, right? It's a great idea. And indeed, that's what farming families do. They tend to have lots of kids because there's lots of work to do. But for foragers, they don't want that. Right? Have you guys ever been to like Walmart or whatever and you see like a mom with her three kids and they're all like hanging off her and she's like just trying to do the grocery shopping but she can't because there's all these kids all over her? Yeah, can you imagine having to walk 10 or 12 kilometers to forage for food with those three kids? Not happening, right? You're all, you're all gonna die. And so foragers tend to be a little more careful, right? They tend to have just one kid every few years, right? And so they're kind of careful about this. They breastfeed their infants for a long time, which makes it less likely for the mother to get pregnant again. Again, they don't want a ton of kids because it's difficult to move around with them. Plus, you don't want your population to go too high, right? Because nature only provides so much food. And so Jared Diamond suggests here that as women are having more and more kids, they kind of get stuck in the home, right? Because they're always either pregnant or they're looking after the kids that they have. And so their kind of role in producing food kind of decreases, you know? They kind of lose that, they're not a part of production anymore, right? 
whereas the foraging women were, right? They were out all the time, you know, collecting roots and nuts and seeds and all kinds of things, and probably feeding the group more consistently than the men, because sometimes you go hunting and you don't, you don't get anything, right? So foraging women are, you know, making a very equal contribution to production, to food getting, but here with farming, they kind of start to lose that power because they're, you know, again, constantly at home, pregnant, trying to deal with this, you know, small herd of children that <laughs> they're, they're creating, right? Uh, and so Jared Diamond says, yeah, this is, this is part of it too, right? They lose their role in production and they kind of lose their social power at the same time. Um, and so this is the question I think that Vittoria just asked, right? Why, if, if this is so bad, if this is such a disastrous choice, why don't people just go back? What do you think about that? If this is such a disaster, why keep doing it? Okay. Okay. So maybe maybe society has become sufficiently unequal that they have kind of no choice but to continue. Okay. You good? What else? What else might be the reason? I hadn't thought of that, Victoria, actually, but yeah, that could be part of what's going on. What else? This is so bad. Why why stick with it? Yeah, and, and, and that's one of the things that the progressivists said, right, is that this is, you know, this is kind of a predictable food source, right? When you're hunting and gathering, you have to go out and look for your food every day, right? When you're a farmer, you don't. You just look out your back window and say, yep, there's my food. <laughs> no problem, right? So it is a little more, it feels a little more comfortable in a way, right? It feels a little more stable to know that, yeah, I know where my food is. It's right there. It'll be there tomorrow too, and the day after. I know where it is, right? I have some kind of control over it, right? It's 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 here instead of I don't know where it is, right? So there's a, I guess there's a comfort level to that, a predictability level. They probably get used to it. Like they probably get used to having that food supply right there. What else? Why not go back? So maybe, maybe they kind of just didn't realize what was happening, right? And I think, Felicia, you and I were talking yesterday and I said that, you know, we should think about this transition of um, foraging to farming as taking like generations, right? Hundreds of years are going by. So it's not, you know, it's not foragers waking up one morning and saying, okay, now we're, now we're farmers, right? It's a slow transition, right? It's a slow process. And maybe they didn't quite realize what was happening because it took so long, right? What's the, what's the kind of analogy that people use all the time? The, the, the frog that's in the water, and if you turn up the heat slowly enough, the frog doesn't realize it's boiling or something, or it's cooking in the pot. It's kind of a gross, it's kind of a gross analogy, but that's the thing, right? Is that, that the transition happens so slowly that maybe people don't realize that it's not as good as it was before, right? Um, anything else? Oh, so like skill-wise? Yeah, that's probably very true as well, right? Because 
we said that hunting and gathering is a very, you really need to know what you're doing, right? There's a lot of skills involved in terms of knowing about the plants and the animals and how to make your own clothes and shelters. And th there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things you need to know. And as people slowly transition to agriculture, they kind of forget those things. Right? They forget those skills because they're learning new ones, right? Like how to plant and how to harvest and how to store your food and all of that stuff, right? They're, they, they've got new skills now. They don't know how to go back. Do you know how to go back? Could I turn you loose in the woods of northern B BC and you could hunt and gather? No, right? We'd all die <laughs> because we've, we've all forgotten those skills, right? Certainly it's been longer for us than for them. But yeah, maybe they don't really know how to do that anymore, right? Those, those skills are hundreds of years old and people have kind of forgotten them. Any other reason? Oh, okay. So you feel like they, th their health might not support it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's true. Um, yeah, well, it certainly wasn't as good as it was before, right? So there's, yeah, there could be something, could be something there. Anything else that we want to add? They realize what? Other than traditions and other cultures. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's another thing too, right? Is that foragers were really intent on sharing everything with each other. And now people are probably developing a bit of a sense of ownership, right? This is my land and my farm. That's your land and your farm, right? Stay off my land, Kenny, or else. <laughs> no. But yeah, so people might not be kind of, well, I guess it's a culture change is what it is, right? People are not quite into sharing so much anymore, which hunting and gathering relies on, right? People need to share in order to survive out there, right? Sharing is, sharing is how you make sure that you have food every day, right? You, you, share, you share when you have it, and then when you don't, other people share with you. Ooh, this is good, good stuff. Um, everything you said, I think, is is probably part of the equation here in some way, right? And again, yeah, I think they would have forgotten their skills, you know? Yes, I think that, you know, they, they were kind of in a structure where they, you know, they, they might not have had the freedom to do different things, right? They might have gotten used to it, right? They might have gotten comfortable, right? Certainly, you know, stability is often comfortable and change is often scary, right? And so people may have been unlikely to to switch back. Um, one of the things that, that Jared Diamond says, and I want to mention, and I mentioned it yesterday, um, was the idea of population growth and carrying capacity. Okay? So what's kind of happening here is that, again, foraging or hunting gathering populations, they tend to try and keep them stable, right? Because Nature only provides so much food. But the idea here is that, you know, humans are very successful creatures, right? We're very smart, we're very adaptable. We know how to get food in pretty much any situation. We can eat all kinds of things. And so we probably were successful and our numbers probably did start to grow, right? Not like they're growing today, you know, not straight up, but they were probably increasing. And eventually you get to a point where you know, you're, you're starting to run a little bit low on food, right? Finding food isn't as easy as it used to be because there's more of you, right? You could have moved around more in the past, but now there's those other hunter-gatherer groups, they're bigger too, and you're kind of bumping into them more often or you're, you know, kind of getting in each other's way as you hunt and gather, right? And so as populations go up, there's less available food, right? And, and the question is, is kind of, what do you what do you do about that right and as i think jared diamond points out you have two choices right S some people can starve or you have to somehow 
generate more food, right? You have to raise the carrying capacity of the land. Somehow you have to get more food out of the same piece of land. And how do you do that? Well, you start to farm a little bit, right? You start to maybe just plant, maybe you just sow seeds, right? Anywhere you go, you know, if you see some wheat, maybe you throw it in places where you think it will grow, right? Or maybe you kind of take weeds out of the way, or maybe you burn down sections of land so that they'll grow back, right? You just start doing these little things. You're still hunting and gathering, but you're just kind of helping Mother Nature along a little bit here and there, right? And the idea here is that as populations continue to rise, people have to start doing more, right? They have to start raising the carrying capacity of the land more and more. And eventually what kind of happens is that you become kind of committed to this farming lifestyle, right? There's now too many of you. You can't really move around because there's people in the next valley and in the next valley, so you can't really go into their land. There's not enough food in your area to kind of just hunt and gather anymore. And you kind of become more reliant on farming, right? As your numbers grow, there's only so many animals, right? They're not gonna stay in the area to be hunted by you, right? They're not stupid. They're gonna disappear too. And so you're gonna have to become kind of more and more committed to this farming thing. And again, if you think about it happening over hundreds of years, then it makes sense, right? And, and I think, yeah, I think we, we got to the point where, yeah, people, you know, people lost those skills, right? They, they forgot, they forgot how to hunt and gather, right? But now, there's too many of them to go back, right? Imagine today, if everyone in Vancouver, if we said, you know what, tomorrow, hunting and gathering, right? No, we're not going to the grocery store, we're not getting skipped the dishes, we're not going to Starbucks, nothing, none of that stuff. We are hunting and gathering, right? How long do you think it would take for the million people that live in Vancouver to strip this city of anything edible. Yeah, half an hour, right? Because there's just not that much to naturally eat here, right? All the seagulls would be dead pretty quickly, right? And all the crows, people would hunt all the crows. And then, you know, all of the berries that grew naturally, they'd all be stripped off the bushes. And then, I don't know, what are we eating? Leaves, bugs, I don't know, right? There's just not a lot of naturally occurring food in the city of Vancouver, especially when there's a million people here, right? So we can't go back to foraging. And the simil they were in a similar kind of trap, right? Your population gets too big, you're stuck, right? You can't really go back unless somehow your population seriously decreases, right? But how that happens, I don't know, right? And so. It doesn't. Your, your only choice is to put more energy in and start to farm, right? And, and that's kind of what people do. Again, it's not a quick change. It's a gradual transition, right? From hunting and gathering to kind of helping nature along a little bit to, you know, maybe growing things here and there to eventually being, you know, fully invested in your land and your, your crops. Um, and again, that's going to be a big, that's going to be a big change. Right? So I tried to find a graphic, like a representation of raising carrying capacity. It's kind of the best I came up with. It's still not that good. Um, but this is kind of what happens, right? So populations rise, you start running out of food, you need to raise the carrying capacity. You need to figure out how to get more out of it, right? And we've done that as well, right? Um, people after this will move to intensive agriculture for the same reason, because their populations get too high for simple farming. And then populations got too high for intensive agriculture, and so now we've moved to mechanized agriculture, right? Big fields, big farms, tractors and combines and genetically modified organisms and all kinds of things that allow us to produce even more food. And so we kind of, us humans keep doing that, right? We keep finding ways to get 
more food out of the same piece of land, right? But in the process, we kind of make our food gathering less efficient, right? Nothing is more efficient than just walking around and grabbing food off the trees, right? That's super easy, right? Low, you don't have to work very hard. Think of how much energy goes into our food, right? So nobody has any food here, but if you went to get a sandwich at Tim Hortons at lunch, think of how much energy goes into all of those ingredients, right? The growing of them, the fertilization, the pesticides, the watering, the tractors to harvest it, all that stuff gets sent to a factory in a truck, then it goes somewhere else, and then it finally makes it to Tim Hortons where they're paying people to put it together for you and wrap it up, right? There's people working at Tim Hortons corporate office keeping track of everything. Like if you add up the amount of energy that goes into that sandwich, massive, right? It's a massive amount of energy that goes into that sandwich. But again, so as we've kind of done this, as we've continually increased the carrying capacity of the land, really we've become less efficient. Right? The most efficient thing was just to go out into nature and pick it off the trees, right? But this allows us to feed more people, right? And Again, it's made us successful, the ability to do this. But anyway, that's kind of what, that's what Jared Diamond's saying here, right? People don't turn back because they really can't. You, you, you get stuck, right? You, at some point, you forget your skills, your population is too high, you've modified the landscape too much, and you just can't go back to where you were, right? And again, that, that remains more true today than it was in the past. We certainly can't go back to hunting and gathering at all, right? It's just, it can't work for us anymore. Poof, okay, wanna take a break? I definitely do. Um, did, does that sound like the article that you read? Does that kind of jive with your understanding of, of what, okay, okay. Um, that's good. I'm, I am looking forward to reading what you, what you wrote. And again, even if you're a little bit off, that's okay. I do wanna see where we are and then I can sort of design more assignments based on what I know about what we can, what we can do in here, okay? But let's take a little break and then when we come back, we'll return to Mesopotamia, okay? Yay. Yay.
we go. All right, and we are officially back. So, um, yeah, so let's leave Jared Diamond here. I, I wanted to use that to explain the transition from foraging to farming, and I think we have done that. Um, but I also mentioned yesterday that, um, again, people had to level up again, right? Because as people switch to simple farming, it works for a while, but eventually what happens is, again, your populations start to grow, especially if you're having big farming families like with nine kids, right? Your populations are going to grow pretty quickly, and then you're going to have to switch to what we call intensive agriculture, right? And intensive agriculture is where, again, you farm the same field over and over again. You're using technology like plows or pesticides or fertilizers in order to kind of increase the amount of food you can get out of one piece of land. And again, it works quite well. And usually um, societies that practice intensive agriculture can grow more food than they really need. And again, that's going to be useful for them. I, gave, I showed you this yesterday. I showed you this yesterday of, you know, as an example of some early intensive agriculture and maybe some not so early intensive agriculture because it's still going on in some parts of the world. Um, but I said that societies that have intensive agriculture have created technology. And these irrigation canals are an important part of it, especially for these early civilizations that we'll talk about because they all appeared in parts of the world that are very warm and very dry. And you need to, you need to water your crops, right? You need to water these things. And so, yeah, I showed you some pictures here yesterday. Um, and I showed you this graphic, right? And I won't beat you over the head with it by going through it completely again. But I will say that all this whole thing ties on a food surplus, right? If you don't have more, if you don't produce more food than you need, none of this can happen, right? Because otherwise everyone is a farmer, everyone's just trying to feed their family and look after their crops, right? But again, if you can produce more food than you need, it frees people to do other things, right? To specialize in different crafts and different businesses, but also to kind of develop some sort of organizational structure. And again, as you can imagine, the more people you have living in a in a particular place, the more you need somebody to be in charge, right? You need somebody to make the rules. You need somebody to decide disputes, right? When I say that the boundary of my farm is right here and Kenny says, uh, no, it's actually somewhere else, right? Who's going to decide? Well, Kenny and I could just kill each other and we could decide it that way. Or we could have some sort of a leadership structure, right? We could have some sort of a government. Right? And that's kind of what starts to happen. This administration starts to you know, look after these canals, but later they expand to look after other parts of society too. And before you know it, people have risen up and are in charge of the whole thing, right? And they make themselves kings or pharaohs or whatever, right? Emperors in some case. So again, I won't go through that again, but that all hinges on intensive agriculture and food surplus, right? And that led us to our first civilization, Mesopotamia. I said it's not a culture, it's a, it's a, it's a region, it's a place. And it's this place, right? Right in the Middle East here, mostly where modern uh, Iraq is, but it kind of enters a few other uh, modern countries as well. And it's this land between the two rivers where people start to farm starting around 12,000 years ago. Right? Um, it's kind of a unique early civilization because again, it's not one culture, it's actually a few cultures that sort of rise and fall in this area. But also it's not one that's kind of unified. It <coughs> develops as a bunch of little city-states and the the city-states tend to fight with each other and try to take one another over. And so it's not kind of, it's not like a single country, in at least in its early stages. It's a bunch of little cities that are kind of fighting it out. 
Yeah, so here are our cultures. Again, I won't go into too much detail. The Sumerians are the first one there, and we'll spend a bit of time with them, uh, and maybe a little bit with the Akkadians later. But again, these are kind of different cultures that come in and conquer the area and begin to, um, you know, kind of practice civilization in this part of the world. Um, I said that Mesopotamia was important because of the creation of these cities. Again, cities don't really exist before Mesopotamia and from the invention of writing, which we'll get to. Talked a little bit about dates yesterday too. I won't beat you over the head with that because that would be cruel. Um, yeah, and again, this is the, the process I described to you with that little graphic and the boxes. That's kind of exactly what we see happening in Mesopotamia, right? Their populations are increasing. They switch to intensive agriculture and start producing more food than they need. And civilization becomes more complex from there, right? In terms of what people do, but also in terms of a social structure itself and the beginning of some kind of state, right? Some kind of government with a, a ruler or a king. So, I pulled out this yesterday. I asked you to read it and answer some questions. And I, I think I'd kind of like to give you just a little more time to refresh your memory on it before we jump back in. Um, so can I give you eight minutes? Does that sound like enough? I know it's a weird number, but eight minutes. All right. I'll give you eight minutes to get your textbook out. Again, look over these pages again answer the questions that are on the next page, which I'll actually I'll put up here. So it's, it's section 2.5, Ancient Mesopotamia. Um, again, just give it a quick read, answer the questions, and then, and then we'll talk about them. Yeah.
if you're if you're having trouble logging in or to give you that other user, go with your ID, not your like login. Yeah. So if you try and answer some questions here just so we're not stuck with computer issues, but I am going to, I'm going to follow up on that. Okie dokie. Uh, right. So, okay, Mesopotamia, right? So we have these two rivers here flowing through this, this region, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and they were kind of important for the ancient people of Mesopotamia. What, why were these rivers important? Okay, so kind of two things, right? Number one, fresh water. You are living in a desert, <laughs> basically, right? So you need, you need fresh water from somewhere. It doesn't really fall from the sky in this part of the world, or at least not in any great quantity. So you need water, right? And these rivers are gonna supply people with not only the water they need to drink and live, but also for them to grow their crops, right? So the the, the river is important for that, or the rivers are important for that. What else are they important for? They have another function. They have another use. Daily use of water? Yeah. So. Definitely, right? Humans need to drink, but they, you know, need to wash their clothes and do all kinds of things. So the river is useful for that, right? It's useful for watering the crops, and then it kind of becomes useful for another thing too. What? Uh, yes. Oh, right, right. Actually, I wasn't thinking of that, but that's true, right? So they talk about the river flooding all the time, right? And Again, we might think, oh, that's a bad thing. But in this part of the world at this time, it's actually, the flooding of the river is actually a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Oh, okay, pause on that. Well, why is it a good thing that the river floods? Yeah, it makes, it makes the land fertile, right? So the river kind of rises up over its banks. It floods the fields, right? It floods the, the river delta. And then when the river goes back down, it leaves a bunch of organic material, right? This silt that's got all kinds of decomposing plant matter and all sorts of, you know, gross crap in it. You don't really want to drink that, but it's good for the fields, right? And so every time the river floods and then goes back down, it leaves a nice layer of fresh, fertile mud, right? It's natural fertilizer, right? These guys don't have to do anything. They don't have to fertilize their fields because the river is doing it for them, right? Every once in a while. So actually I'd forgotten about that, Felicia, but that's good. The river fertilizes the fields. And then Kenny said, it's also good for transportation, right? This is a, you know, kind of a dry, hot part of the world and boats are a nice, easy way to get from one place to the other, right? And I think you read that they're, they start to, trade along that, along those rivers as well, right? It's an easy way to carry things, right? Building a boat and floating stuff down the river is way easier than, you know, you know lugging it on a, you know, a cart or something like that, right? So the river becomes an important means of transportation, or the rivers, I should say, become an important means of transportation. So you can kind of see why, you know, everyone kind of is attracted to the river, right? They definitely need to drink, right? So they don't die, but they also need to, you know, f irrigate their fields, right? And then 
the river is fertilizing those fields, right? And they're able to move up and down the river and kind of interact and trade with other cities, right? So the rivers become very, very, very important. And we'll see as we go forward that almost all of these ancient civilizations appear next to or on rivers, right? Because the river will provide the same benefits to basically all of these civilizations, right? Drinking water, water for kind of other uses, fertilizing fields, transporting goods, all of these things will be done with the river. So we'll see lots of river civilizations appear and the Mesopotamian ones are just, are just one. Um, the textbook mentions that these floods kind of got out of control sometimes, right? The, the Tigris and the Euphrates could be unpredictable. Sometimes they didn't flood enough. Sometimes they flooded a lot and in a catastrophic way and could sweep away your house and your fields and all kinds of things. So what did the Mesopotamians do? Yeah, so they created kind of a network of canals and ditches and reservoirs so that they could try to control the river, right? When the river starts to overflow and flood, there are all these different channels that the water can go into, right? And they can store some water over here or divert water around their fields and they could kind of control the flow a little bit, right? And again, you know, it probably didn't, you know, it probably wasn't a perfect system, but they were able to kind of utilize the river, right? And make sure it, they could get water from it, but that it wouldn't destroy everything that they had built, right? That's smart. And it takes a lot of engineering know-how and planning to do such a thing, right? But again, they figured it out. They knew how to do it. Um, what kind of resources did the Mesopotamians have naturally? What's that? They had the river, right? The river is a huge natural or natural resource. Yeah. What else did they have, or what did they not have? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they they kind of don't have a lot, right? They've got the river, which is very helpful. They have a lot of mud, and <laughs> but they don't have a lot of good quality building stone. They don't have a lot of good quality metal. They don't really have any wood from trees. So, so there's kind of a lot of things that they, it would be nice if they had, but they don't, right? And so they'll, as we'll see, I think tomorrow, they'll make good use of that mud that they have, but they'll also trade with other places to get the things that they need, right? Um, so yeah, not, not a ton of natural resources, but they've got enough to work with, right? Um, Maybe this is the last question I'll ask you. I'll ask you number five, and then we'll deal with number four tomorrow because we're almost out of time. Um, they, the text says that the Sumerians were polytheistic. What does that mean? Yeah, they worshiped multiple gods and goddesses, right? So poly is many, right? And theistic, I think it's theos is, theos is God, is the Greek word for God, I think. Don't quote me on that. My Greek is a little rusty. Um, yeah, see, we've got polytheos. We've got multiple gods. If you only have one god, what, are, what kind of religion are we talking about? Yeah, monotheistic, right? So if you're a Christian or a Jewish person or a Muslim, you belong to a monotheistic religion, right, with only one god. But the Sumerians are polytheistic. They've got lots and lots of different gods to worship. Uh, but again, we'll we'll deal with the gods tomorrow as well. Maybe not. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe the day after. Um, okay. I'm going to press pause there because we have worked hard enough for today. Do not forget today is Tuesday. Uh, on Thursday, we're going to have our first quiz. I've got to post some stuff in Microsoft Teams to explain how that will work and I'm going to do that right after um, and then I'm going to mark your um, I should be able to mark your agricultural revolution articles this afternoon so uh, unless there are any questions I will turn you loose and you can go acquire well no 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 we've switched to farming now so now you will 
you know, barter in exchange for food that has been grown by farmers. Mm -hmm. We've kind of, we've leveled up now. Different subsistence strategy. When's what? It's, uh, Thursday, Thursday morning. This Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is all, people. Um, have a good afternoon. It's nice and sunny. It's beautiful. Have a nice afternoon, and I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Toodaloo.